Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us. Episode 31, Apollo Program Flight 1, Apollo 7. Head colds and helmets. Last time, we took a difficult look at the Apollo 1 mission and discussed what caused this terrible accident. The crew, Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee, were killed in mere seconds when an electrical arc set off an uncontrollable blaze in the overpressurized pure oxygen environment of their vehicle. Spaceflight has always been and always will be risky. All of the astronauts assumed that a crew would be lost someday, but because of something dangerous and difficult to control. For a crew to be killed in what was supposed to be a non-hazardous ground test because of shoddy worksmanship was simply unthinkable. NASA had a long road to recovery ahead of them before they could fly again. Changes, both major and minor, needed to be made to further fireproof the spacecraft and ensure that a repeat accident would be all but impossible. One example was changing from a two-dimensional wire harness to a three-dimensional wire harness. Basically, when laying out all of the cables and wires, it used to be common to do this on a big flat surface where it's easier to work with. A 3D harness mimics the final configuration of the wires, bending around corners, going up walls, stuff like that. It's a little trickier, but it's less stress on the wires, which makes a short circuit less likely. Other changes were aimed at making a fire accident more survivable. While the Apollo 1 crew ultimately perished due to toxic fumes rather than the flames, the crew spacesuits were upgraded to be significantly more fireproof. If you look at photos of the Apollo 1 crew and photos of the later crews, you can actually see the difference. The newly added outer layer of fire-resistant beta cloth is bright white with a matte finish. And then, of course, we come to the hatch. The original Apollo hatch was an inward opening design that was firmly wedged into place by the pressurized gas inside the capsule. There is some evidence that Ed White was able to get out of his couch and begin the lengthy process of opening the hatch before succumbing to the smoke. But even if he had, it would have been impossible for him to wrench the hatch open due to the atmosphere of the spacecraft pushing it closed. All future Apollo crews flew with a redesigned outward opening hatch that could be opened in a matter of seconds. Countless other changes to hardware, software, and procedures were made in the 20-month hiatus to make this risky business safer and pave the way for the next demand flight and subject of today's episode, Apollo 7. But, of course, that raises the question, what happened to Apollo 2 through 6? This is one of those quirks of history that's just overly confusing for no good reason. At the time of the accident, there had been three unmanned flights using the uprated Saturn 1B rocket. AS-201, AS-202, and AS-203. AS-204 was to be the first flight with a crew on board, but as we know, never flew. Out of respect for the crew, and in deference to the wishes of the crew's widows, AS-204 was redesignated as Apollo 1. So that would make the next flight Apollo 2, right? Well, no. The next flight was the maiden launch of the Saturn V, and was named Apollo 4. After that was a Saturn 1B that carried the first uncrewed lunar module into low Earth orbit on a mission called Apollo 5, and then another uncrewed test flight of the Saturn V on Apollo 6. So what happened to 2 and 3? I honestly have no idea. They seem to have just skipped them for reasons beyond my understanding. If any of you fine listeners know what the deal with Apollo 2 and 3 are, I would love to hear about it, so please hit me up via email at jp at thespaceabove.us or via Twitter at spaceaboveus. Before we can get to the mission, there's one more order of business to get to. New astronauts! NASA had big plans after the lunar landing mission had been accomplished, so having a deep bench of astronauts was a must. On August 11, 1967, NASA announced the members of Astronaut Group 6, or as they called themselves, the XS-11. As in XS-11? Get it? The group included Joseph Allen, Philip Chapman, Anthony England, Carl Hennies, Donald Holmquist, William Lennar, Anthony Lewin, Story Musgrave, Brian O'Leary, Robert Parker, and William Thornton. Four of those guys would never end up flying in space, 
and the rest had a long wait ahead of them, since the first to fly would be Story Musgrave in April of 1983, 16 years later. Well, see you guys in a few episodes. With Apollo 4, 5, and 6 explained, Apollo 2 and 3 left as inscrutable mysteries, and new astronauts welcomed aboard, we can now move on to what would become the first manned flight of the Apollo program, Apollo 7. The mission was to serve essentially the same purpose as Apollo 1, take the command and service module into low Earth orbit, courtesy of the Saturn 1B rocket, and make sure that everything worked as expected. The planned 11-day mission would tackle some questions that wouldn't necessarily make headlines, but would be critical for the flights to come. Despite its relative obscurity, it was actually a really important flight. If any problems were to emerge with the new Block 2 version of the CSM, it was extremely unlikely that NASA would be able to make their end-of-the-decade goal. The prime crew of Apollo 7 was the backup crew of Apollo 1. They had trained alongside the Apollo 1 crew and had thus been preparing for this flight for years. Between their years of mission-specific training and their deep involvement with the post-fire CSM changes, they were perhaps the most well-versed in the particulars of their spacecraft of any of the Apollo crews. Commanding the mission would be our old friend and Mercury 7 veteran astronaut Wally Schirra. Schirra was a professional test pilot through and through, and had proven that he had what it takes to take a complex spacecraft and really ring out its performance, stick to a schedule, and show the world just what his vehicle was capable of. This was his third and final spaceflight. Alongside him would be astronaut rookie Don Isley, serving as command module pilot. Isley was born in Columbus, Ohio on June 23, 1930, and earned a bachelor's degree from the U.S. Naval Academy and a master's degree from the Air Force Institute of Technology. Like many of his colleagues, he served for several years as a research and test pilot over the deserts of California and New Mexico. Recruited as part of Astronaut Group 3, the 14, in 1963, Isley fit the classic mold of the test pilot astronaut. This was his first and only spaceflight. Rounding out the crew was another astronaut rookie, Walter Cunningham, serving as Lunar Module Pilot. This may come as a surprise given, you know, the lack of a lunar module on this mission, but NASA decided it would be best to be consistent with the job titles, regardless of what vehicles may or may not be present. Cunningham was born on March 16, 1932, in Creston, Iowa. He earned a bachelor's degree, master's degree, and doctorate in physics after several years as a Marine Corps fighter pilot over the skies of Korea. Like Isley, he was also a member of Astronaut Group 3, and also like Isley, this would be his only space mission. When dawn broke over Cape Canaveral on October 11, 1968, it had been exactly 700 days since the previous rocket launch with an American crew on board. Shira, Isley, and Cunningham were prepared to ensure it did not hit 701. As the crew of Apollo 7 arrived at Launch Complex 34 that day, one of the friendly faces that greeted them was that of pad leader Gunter Vent. A familiar presence throughout the Mercury and Gemini days, his role with the space program was to have ended with the move to Apollo. Vent was employed by McDonnell Aircraft, which had manufactured the Mercury and Gemini spacecraft. Apollo was made by North American Aviation. But the astronauts didn't care who he worked for, they wanted Gunter. Largely at Shiraz's insistence, North American hired Vent away from McDonnell and ensured that he would remain the last face the astronauts saw before safely splashing down at the end of their missions. Shortly after the hatch was sealed and all pad personnel had departed, Command Module Pilot Don Isley quipped, I wonder where Gunter Vent. Well, Gunter Vent to take cover because at 11.02 a.m., the largest manned rocket to date lumbered off the pad, becoming the only human spaceflight from Launch Complex 34. The two-stage Saturn 1B had been designed from the start to fly human crews on board and was silky smooth compared to the considerably bumpier Atlas and Titan rockets. Before long, Apollo 7 was deposited into a nearly perfect orbit. First on the agenda was a quick check of attitude control thrusters on the S-4B, 
which was the second stage of the Saturn 1B and the third stage of the Saturn 5. In case of an emergency, the crew could take manual control of the S-4B's attitude, so once they were safely in orbit, they gave it a quick check. Satisfied that the thrusters were working, they could proceed with the next task, simulated lunar module extraction. On later flights, the LEM would be launched within the Spacecraft Lunar Module Adapter, or SLA, a large open cone between the top of the S-4B and the bottom of the CSM. The plan would be to pop the CSM off the top of the S-4B, turn around, come right back, and dock with the LEM. Once safely docked, the CSM would back up again, extracting the LEM with it. Apollo 7 had no LEM, but they could still practice all of the maneuvers required. Shira expertly guided the command module away from the S-4B, turned around, and began moving back toward the spent booster stage. With echoes of Gemini 9A's angry alligator incident, hey, Tom Stafford was even Capcom at the moment, it quickly became apparent that the spacecraft adapter panels had not deployed quite as expected. The SLA was made of four large panels that were designed to peel back, sort of like a giant metal space flower. One of the panels had not peeled back as much as planned. Since this was just a practice run, the mission was not affected, but if the crew had actually been tasked with extracting a LEM, it could have been a real tricky business. To prevent a repeat of this incident, future SLA panels would separate entirely and drift off into space, rather than simply peel back. SLA panel issues aside, the exercise went smoothly and the CSM flew like a dream. After sticking around near their booster for around a half hour, the crew performed a short burn with their attitude control thrusters to slightly lower their orbit and put some distance between themselves and the S-4B. One of the most anticipated items on the schedule was the first ever American television broadcast from space. Audiences across the world had been privileged to live space-based audio before, and mission controllers had seen slow-scan TV images from Mercury, but live video images had never before been shared with the public. Nothing especially dramatic was planned. The mission was dramatic enough on its own. The broadcast was to just feature a tour of the roomy new vehicle, some views out the window, and the usual zero-gravity antics. Shira, however, was not a fan. He viewed the TV broadcast as an unwelcome intrusion on a crew of professionals trying to get a job done. While he eventually relented and put on a decent show, he insisted on delaying the first of several broadcasts until the third day of the mission. This minor act of autonomy would prove to be a hint of things to come. Life aboard Apollo 7 proceeded smoothly. Test firings of the all-important service propulsion system, the large engine at the back of the service module, performed perfectly. In comparison to the lumbering Saturn, it was downright sporty. When they first fired up the engine, the crew were thrown back in their couches and Shira exclaimed, Yabba dabba doo! Flintstones references, they never get old. The large windows had gotten a little grimy from condensation and outgassing from some of the sealant used to attach the windows, but the crew were happy with the view that remained and had no problem using it to revisit their S-4B a few days after launch proving that Apollo could perform orbital rendezvous just fine. All systems performed well, other than a fuel cell being a little finicky. As expected from test runs in the vacuum chamber, some condensation built up on the coolant lines. In zero gravity, of course, the water had nowhere to drip, so the crew got creative and used their urine collection hose to vacuum up the water. Speaking of the urine collection hose, I won't belabor this point, especially after the grody details from the Gemini 7 episode, but waste collection in the command module wasn't exactly pleasant. The Apollo 7 crew passed along the following advice to future Apollo astronauts who may need to go number two. Get naked, allow an hour, have plenty of tissues handy. I think there is a public perception of space flights as being precisely planned down to the second. To be fair, at this point in spaceflight history, it's mostly right. Early missions especially were so short and had so many questions to answer that activities were planned in a specific order with a specific duration. And even as that began to relax, there are still events, such as engine firings, that had to happen at a precise instant, 
But the reality is that astronauts and space mission planners are people too, and sometimes things need to change on the fly. You started to see this more often in Project Gemini, where rather than a strict list of things to do, it was more a list of guidelines and a few specific activities that could be accomplished when appropriate. With three guys aboard Apollo 7 flying a brand new spacecraft, there were bound to be some scheduled changes. But test pilots aren't always the biggest fans of changing things on the fly. They've made it through their careers intact because they stuck to the procedure and did things properly. What started as an improvised thought could end with yanking the eject handle, or worse. So it was that as minor schedule changes were added, friction started to build between the folks down in Houston and the crew of Apollo 7 flying above. Adding to the friction was the fact that first Shira and then Isley and Cunningham developed head colds soon after liftoff. Imagine the misery of a congested nose and pressured sinuses, but with no effective method of relief. It could make the most tolerant among us a little irritated. Hurting from his cold, annoyed with schedule changes, and perhaps with the knowledge that he had already decided to retire, Wally Shira started to get grumpy and the crew soon followed the lead of their commander. For the most part, nothing overly dramatic happened. A few snarky responses to mission control, resistance to schedule changes, some sort of cryptic drinking joke from the 60s that I don't understand, stuff like that. But it doesn't take much to catch the attention of upper management when the whole world is watching. Perhaps the most flagrant example of this occurred right at the end of the mission, when the crew refused to wear their helmets during re-entry. This may seem a little strange at first, but keep in mind that the entire crew is suffering from a cold. They were worried that as the air pressure changed during re-entry, their congested heads wouldn't be able to equalize the pressure and their eardrums would rupture. You can recover from that, it actually happened to me once and I hear fine, but it's not exactly fun. The crew wanted to leave their helmets off, so they could do that trick where you hold your nose and blow to equalize the pressure. As you can imagine, Mission Control was not too excited about this. In a rare move, astronaut boss and Mercury 7 member Deke Slayton got on the radio himself. I'm just going to read this exchange between Slayton and Shira straight from the transcript. Slayton, okay, I think you ought to clearly understand that there's absolutely no experience at all with landing without the helmet on. Shira, and there's no experience with the helmet either on that one. Slayton, that one we've got a lot of experience with, yes. Shira, if we had an open visor, I might go along with that. Slayton, okay, I guess you better be prepared to discuss in some detail when we land why we haven't got them on. I think you're too late now to do much about it. Shira, that's affirmative. I don't think anybody down there has worn the helmets as much as we have. Slayton, yes. Shira, we tried them on this morning. Slayton, understand that. The only thing we're concerned about is the landing. We couldn't care less about the re-entry, but it's your neck, and I hope you don't break it. Shira, thank you, babe. Slayton, over and out. I think that speaks for itself. Not long after that tense exchange, the Apollo 7 command module separated from the service module and began the fiery trip back into the atmosphere. 260 hours after lifting off, the spacecraft splashed down about a mile from the planned spot. At first, the capsule stabilized pointy end down, but the crew inflated some airbags in the nose, and it soon righted itself. Regardless of some minor tension between the ground and the crew, the mission was a complete success. The Apollo spacecraft was ready to fly. Unfortunately, that tension had its consequences. With so many astronauts lined up behind them and eager to follow orders, Don Isley and Walter Cunningham never flew in space again. Within three years... Both men had moved on to other challenges. Also moving on was Wally Shira. With the fourth member of the Mercury 7 leaving our story, it's time for the traditional epilogue. Shira flew aboard Sigma 7, which proved that Mercury was up to the challenge of a 24-hour flight on the next mission, Gemini 6A, which performed the first ever rendezvous with a human spacecraft, and now Apollo 7, clearing the path to the moon. He was the only person to fly aboard Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo. After 10 years as an astronaut, he officially retired in July of 1969, having spent over 12 days in space. 
Sharon moved on to a variety of other things in his post-NASA life, including several business ventures, as well as writing a number of books. He also seems to have gotten over his annoyance at TV broadcasts as he helped provide commentary for the lunar landings to come, and even became a spokesman for a nasal decongestant. If only he'd had them on board at the time. Walter Marty Shira Jr. died of a heart attack on May 3rd, 2007, at the age of 84. Farewell, Wally. Now that the crew of Apollo 7 had proven the command module spaceworthiness, it was naturally time to add the lunar module to the mix and see what it was capable of. Next time, NASA will launch both the CSM and the LEM on the same rocket and... Wait, what's that? The lunar module isn't ready yet. Huh. That really throws a wrench in the works. Well, we do have another CSM and Saturn V ready to go. I know it would only be the second flight of Apollo with a crew on board and only the third flight of the Saturn V ever, but... What do you think about going to the moon? Hey Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders. Wanna go for a ride? Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass.